Good afternoon and welcome to the Contracts Committee of the New York City Council. Today is Monday, September 23rd, 2019. It is uh, 1.10 p.m. My name is Ben Kalos and I have the privilege of chairing this committee. If you're watching at home via the live stream, please feel free to participate by tweeting me at Ben Kalos. I'd like to extend my thanks to Councilmember Eric Ulrich for introducing the bill before the committee today and his continued support for uh, uh, apprenticeship in our city. Apprenticeship programs are a critical part of the city's effort to develop a well-trained workforce with improved opportunities for job placements. Apprenticeships are typically paid positions that offer gradually increasing salaries with offers for employment upon their completion. Apprenticeships usually require several hundred hours of classroom education and several thousand hours of supervised on-the-job training to ensure that graduates of these programs are sufficiently experienced to perform essential work in the city's construction industry. While most construction apprenticeships are typically associated with unions, there are a fair number of so-called merit or open shop apprenticeship programs available to non-union contracts via a local or regional trade associations. These programs are typically made available to small businesses or other non-union contractors who want their employees to be eligible for contracts that require apprenticeship. In 2015, the Mayor's Office of Contracts released the Apprenticeship Program Directive, which offered a number of instructions for contracting agencies, one of which required such agencies to place requirements on certain construction and construction-related maintenance contracts over $3 million. The directive requires that those contracts may only be awarded to contractors who maintain apprenticeship agreements with programs registered with and approved by the New York State Department of Labor. The bill before the committee today, Introduction 694, would amend the Mayor's Apprenticeship Program Directive and lower the threshold requirement for such contracts from $3 million to $1 million. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Contracts Committee staff, Legislative Counsel Alex Polina, Policy Analyst Casey Addison, Finance Analyst Andrew Wilbur, and Finance Unit Head John, John Russell, as well as my Chief of Staff Jesse Townsend, Legislative Director Wilfredo Lopez, for all of their hard work in preparing uh, for this hearing. Uh, just by way of my own background, I come at this uh, as a union side labor and employment lawyer. Full disclosure, prior to being in the City Council, I had the opportunity to represent uh, Labor's International Union of North America, and in particular the Mason Tenders District Council, and in particular Local 79, Local 1010, Local 1018, uh, where we actually uh, fought to ensure that employers were making payroll deductions uh, for both uh, retirement programs, but also for education programs. Had the problem opportunity to see many of the training funds throughout our city and just see exactly what our city has to offer. Uh, for those of you who are interested in getting jobs, a lot of these uh, city contracts also come with a local hire requirement. And the more that this is done properly, the more the opportunity is for somebody to literally walk across the street to a construction site in their neighborhood and say, I'm local, hire me. And actually uh, be able to go onto that site and then through the apprenticeship program, gain the skills that they need to uh, participate and to be safe and uh, have a marketable and skilled trade. Additionally, I passed a local law that requires this uh, anyone doing construction work to report anytime somebody gets injured, God forbid, killed on a construction site and uh, increases penalties to up to $25,000 for a failure to report. The results of those numbers indicate that when you are on a job where all the people on that job have an apprenticeship, have training, have certifications, uh, those jobs seem to be a lot safer than jobs where there are no such requirements. Just going to uh, hold for just one moment. When Councilmember Ulrich joins us, we will uh, ask him to share some more information on his legislation. Uh, in the meantime, we will uh, call our first panel from the administration, Douglas Sapari, Ryan Murray, and Amy Peterson. And I'll now ask the committee council to uh, swear you in. Would you all please raise your right hands? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Kalos and members of the Contracts Committee. My name is Ryan Murray, and I serve as the first Deputy Director of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, or MOX. Thank you for inviting the administration to begin conversations about the Apprenticeship Program Directive requirements. 
The apprenticeship program directive has existed in various forms since 2006. The directive of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, who is the city's chief procurement officer, may issue various guidelines and procedures to ensure that procurement is conducted in the best interests of the city of New York. These guidelines are often developed in partnership with policy leaders, and this was the case with the apprenticeship directive, which was developed in collaboration with the then Deputy Mayor for Economic Development as a result of recommendations from the 2005 Commission on Construction Opportunity. The city determined that it was best served by doing business with companies that share our commitment to delivering robust training programs and good paying jobs for workers. Apprentices are workers who, are form who formally build knowledge and skills through classroom and on the job training and are registered with the New York State Department of Labor or New York State DOL. Apprenticeship programs can be sponsored by employers, jointly by employers and unions, or by groups of employers. Each program must also be registered with New York State DOL. Programs depending on the tr vary depending on the trade, but can last for several years. The directive applies, applies to prime co construction contracts and maintenance service contracts that use apprenticeable construction-related trade classifications that are valued at $3 million or more and subcontracts in such prime contracts valued at $2 million or more. It requires that contractors have, prior to entering to such contract or subcontract, <coughs> apprenticeship agreements appropriate for the type and scope of work to be performed, and those apprenticeship programs must be registered with the New York State DOL. Most recently, the directive was issued in 2015. This coincided with a set of newly executed project labor agreements, or PLAs, that were negotiated between the City and the Building and Construction Trades Council, or BCTC. In FY18, 2.3 billion of 3.3 billion in newly registered construction contracts were subject to the directive. The directive requires that city agencies include in the solicitation documents for the applicable procurements a requirement that the awarded contractor has the appropriate apprenticeship agreements. Prior to award, agencies must ensure that the contractors have those apprenticeship programs in place for the type and scope of work to be performed under the contract. For example, if the contract is for plumbing, the contractor must have a plumbing apprenticeship program that is approved by the New York State DOL and has passed the state's probationary period. As I previously mentioned, contractors can meet this requirement by demonstrating that they have a program that is either directly sponsored by the employer, jointly sponsored by employers or unions, or sponsored by groups of employers. Similarly, when those prime contracts submit names of subcontractors to agencies for approval, the subcontractors must have the appropriate apprenticeship programs if the subcontractors are valued at two million or more. Intro 674 requires that, MOCs reduce, requires that MOCs reduce the threshold value for contracts covered by the directive. We'd like to learn more about the intended outcomes of the proposal and further explore impacts to small businesses and minority and women-owned business enterprises, or MWBEs, as we would not want to introduce any new barriers to entry for potential contractors. We all share the commitment to creating good-paying jobs for workers and establishing career pathways in the construction industry. Apprenticeships help to create structured opportunities for workers and expanding slots is important to creating more opportunities for New Yorkers who be can become skilled in their crafts and potentially start their own businesses. We look forward to continuing conversations with labor and industry leaders and advocates for MWBEs so we can adopt the best approach to strengthening career pathways and building strong businesses that serve our communities. Again, thank you for the opportunity for to share our initial thoughts on the directive. I'm joined by Douglas Lipari, Associate Director and Counsel at MOX, who can help us respond to any questions you may have, and Amy Peterson, Director of the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development, who will provide additional background information on apprenticeships and this administration's overall workforce development efforts. Amy. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chairperson Kalos and members of the Committee on Contracts. I'm Amy Peterson, Director of the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development. The Mayor's Office of Workforce Development is driving an equity agenda for the future of work in New York City. By working across city agencies and in partnership with the workforce development community to expand access to good jobs for all New Yorkers, we are committed to creating careers in construction for New Yorkers through apprenticeship opportunities. The city recognizes the benefits of apprenticeship in providing a path into a career in the construction industry. The city works closely with the building and construction trades unions to support this pathway through funding and recruitment for specific pre-apprenticeship training programs. Apprentices receive three to five years of paid classroom and hands-on training that leads to them being a skilled tradesperson in a career with benefits and upward mobility. The city invests in pre-apprenticeship training programs that have direct entry opportunities for graduates with the building and construction trades unions. As outlined in Career Pathways Report, 
The city itself is the largest purchaser of construction services across the five boroughs. A unique opportunity exists to leverage the billions of dollars budgeted for these projects to create new employment and advancement paths for job seekers and low wage workers. To this end, we are working to create construction career opportunities for New York City residents interested in benefiting from the city's construction investment and beyond. Beginning in 2014, the Housing Recovery Office focused on ensuring Sandy impacted residents participated in the city's recovery and rebuilding efforts. Working in partnership with the Alliance for Just Rebuilding, elected officials, Faith in New York, Align, and other partners, the city established a model for integrating hiring of local residents and training local residents for construction careers. In partnership with the Department of Small Business Services, the city launched Sandy Recovery Workforce One, linking Sandy impacted residents to build it back job openings in the wider Workforce One system, including pre-apprenticeship training programs. As a result, over 150 Sandy residents joined New York City's construction unions. Then NYCHA's Recovery and Resilience Department invested an additional $1.4 million in pre-apprenticeship training. SBS continues to fund pre-apprenticeship programs, including the Edward J. Malloy Initiative for Construction Skills, Non-Traditional Employment for Women, New York City District Council of Carpenters Building Works, Pathways to Apprenticeship, and New York City Helmets to Hard Hats, an organization that focuses on military veterans. As a result of this investment, to date almost 300 New York City residents have been connected to a career in the unionized construction industry. A union apprenticeship is not a job, it is a career. By investing in pre-apprenticeship training and utilizing apprentices on our contracts, we are creating a ladder for low-income New Yorkers into the middle class. Union membership offers middle class wages and benefits, a pension, annuity, and equal pay for all workers. Most importantly, a union apprenticeship allows low-income New Yorkers to earn a living while becoming an expert in one of the skilled trades through paid on-the-job and classroom training. One such example is Far Rockaway resident Jamel Dickerson. When the hurricane hit, he knew he wanted to be a part of the recovery effort. He <coughs> learned about Sandy Recovery Workforce One at a PTA meeting and entered the Edward J. Malloy Initiative for Construction Skills Training Program. After working to rebuild homes in his Far Rockaway community, he is now as a third-year carpenter apprentice working at Harlem Hospital. Thank you. Thank you. We've been joined by uh, Council Member Inez Barron. The current threshold is three million. Why did the administration set it at three million to begin with? So as Ryan, so as Ryan mentioned in his testimony, the uh, initial apprenticeship directive was uh, set in 2006, and that came out of conversations and discussions and negotiations with the various stakeholders. That includes labor unions, uh, contractor associations, small businesses, and WBEs. And as in 2006, when the uh, mayor's uh, Commission on Construction Opportunity made a recommendation in consul consultation with all those stakeholders, $3 million was uh, the threshold that they landed on. What is the uh, difference in value of contracts over three million and uh, contracts over one million? What is the difference? How much? How much do we currently cover? How much would be covered? So I think you're asking for the kind of the, the one to three million dollar threshold. So in a uh, fiscal well, year, first tell us what the current threshold covers. How many? What the dollar value is, and well, perhaps the number of contracts at three million, so and then what the difference would be. How much we'd be adding. So currently, the uh, apprenticeship directive covers $2.3 billion or $3.3 billion of total construction. Uh, that was in fiscal year 18. And in the <coughs> if the apprenticeship directive were to be lowered to $1 million, it would add approximately uh, $167 million of uh, construction contracts. With regard to the larger contracts, over $5 million and $3 million, what does MWBE participation look like versus contracts of over a million and then even under a million? And, and the reason I'm asking, and I, I've asked it in an open-ended way, but I, I've heard concerns from MWBEs that they feel that they are not able to even bid on some of the larger contracts. So MWBEs, uh, certainly based on the data over the past five years that we've looked at, have done better in the $1 to $3 million range than they have in the uh, 5 to $7 million range in terms of 
prime contract received. So um, I believe the percentages are about, um, well, varies from about 25% is the kind of the range between uh, one to three million, but then once you get above five million like US, it goes down to 16%. Or that 16% for the MWBE, are those MWBEs able to meet the apprenticeship uh, requirements? So any contract that would require the apprenticeship director requirements, and again, this- So these are the contracts over three million where you're saying 15% participation, uh, are, are the MWBEs meeting the apprenticeship requirement? So just to, just to clarify, so over $3 million is when the apprenticeship directive Mm -hmm. kicks in. However, that is not every single contract that is over $3 million. As uh, we mentioned, we have project labor agreements that do meet essentially the purpose of the apprenticeship directive, but are different types of contracts. So it's a mix of uh, various contracts there. However, any contractor who is bidding on a job or is awarded a contract subject to the directive must demonstrate to the agency that they can in fact meet the uh, requirements of the apprenticeship directive, and they will do that by submitting the appropriate documentation uh, to the agency for review. And, and I guess, and so if somebody wanted to participate, uh, d does MOC support people who are doing business with the seed and assist them with trying to meet the regulatory requirements? Do you ever connect people with apprenticeship programs, or how, how does that work? So MOX directly will not, does not work to uh, connect contractors with uh, apprenticeship programs, but the city as a whole, as uh, Amy mentioned, we've you know, engaged the various stakeholders, including labor, contractor associations, small businesses, MWBEs, in trying to uh, come at workforce development from a variety of angles, from free apprentice programs, like Amy mentioned. What is the impact of Local Law 196 of 2017 and the site safety training so far on your contracts? So we don't, today we don't have the uh, particular data on the specific impacts of the Local Law 196. I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, Council Member Inez Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for coming. So. Now, the, what are the requirements now for, uh, for a contractor to be able to say, I have an apprentice program? What, what are the descriptors that tell me this is, in fact, an apprenticeship program? Um, to have an apprenticeship program, it has to actually be registered with the New York State Department of Labor. So they have to demonstrate that they have uh, an apprenticeship program registered with the, they're connected, affiliated with an apprenticeship program that's registered with the State Department of Labor. Oh, so it's registered with the State Department of Labor as an apprenticeship program. Correct. Okay, and would, uh, if we're reducing it to smaller companies, they would have to meet that same criteria? That's the legislative proposal, correct. And what do you think might be some of the challenges then for small businesses to be able to meet those requirements? Did you ask this question already? Yes. Oh, okay. So I think, you know, the, uh, if there's a cost associated right. with uh, having an apprentice program, maybe uh, financial, but also in terms of staff. So some small businesses may not have the, uh, the staff dedicated to, to doing something like that, to having the programs. There is a, a the state is a, the entity that authorizes the use of apprentices and it has to be registered with the state, so it's not necessarily an overnight process and uh, there is a, a process that contractors must go through in order to utilize apprentices. So in the requirements or the description at the state level uh, that registers apprenticeship programs, when is it considered to be successful? Do these apprentices go on to get jobs in unions or do they get other certification or are they locked in there? Do we have to see that they move beyond just the status of being an apprentice? 
Sorry, I'm having trouble with my button there. Um, so I'm not an expert on State Department of Labor requirements okay. for apprenticeship, but generally, um, and I know more about the union apprenticeships than the, the okay. non-union ones, although there are some registered apprenticeship programs. So when you um, enter an apprenticeship program and a union apprenticeship program, you're actually a union member and you're getting wages and you're working. And right. so you advance with the work in the apprenticeship program and in the union. And then when you graduate from the apprenticeship program, you're a journey level worker. And that's all the, the State Department of Labor sets the requirements for, as, as we mentioned in our earlier testimony, if you're a plumber, there are certain requirements that you have to go through each year related mm -hmm. to the training and related to the on, the on the job training to graduate through that apprenticeship program that is consistent across all registered apprenticeship programs for that trade. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For currently projects with a value less than $3 million, what experience would somebody doing plumbing work for the city need? Would they have any experience requirement? Similarly, if somebody was building a, a, a building something out of wood, would they have to have any experience or could they, uh, is there any training requirement? Again, not my area of expertise, but for plumbing, um, to get Department of Building Permits, you have to work with a registered licensed plumber, and again, might not be using the exact same terms, and then the new safety training requirements, but I don't believe there's other requirements for the training. And somebody was, if somebody was doing brick work or, or carpentry work, would they have to have any training on these projects with less than $3 million? So I, I just generally speaking, right, an agency may require particular uh, requirements and qualifications and experience on a particular contract, depending on the type of work that is being involved. Um, in terms of, uh, so and that wouldn't vary necessarily depending just on but whether or not but it's But there's no standard. So somebody who needs, who, who you go to to get your hair cut might need 10,000 hours of on-the-job training, but somebody building heavy machinery on a dangerous construction site uh, where the value is less than three million might not. So again, I think that the requirements may be at or kind of placed at the contractor level and there may be other, and like Amy, sure. I'm, I'm not an expert on all of the requirements for being able to have a license to do certain types of construction work. Some require licenses, some may not, depending on the type of work, but. Okay, uh, I'd like to, thank uh, Councilman Rarick Ulrich for sponsoring this legislation. It has a supermajority of the City Council. Uh, it, he was able to force the scheduling of a hearing, but when I came on as the contracts chair, I actually asked the House if we could hear it immediately. Uh, so uh, we, we moved it up a little bit and tried to make sure we, we uh, made this process a lot faster, but I'll turn it over to the bill sponsor who's been doing all the work on it. So. Thank you to Eric Ulrich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize. I was late. I was on the A train and at J Street, someone pulled the emergency brake and we started running on the F line. So I apologize uh, for being late, but I want to thank you uh, and my colleagues for being here today. This is a very important piece of legislation, one that I think is going to go a long way toward uh, making New York City a much more affordable place for. Uh, the middle class and those struggling to make it into the middle class. I, I come from a union household. My grandfather, until the day he died, was a steam fitter in Local 638, and I know how important the prevailing wages were uh, to my family, to the benefits that were negotiated through the collective bargaining process, um, not only for him but for all the members. And, uh, and so I believe that this bill will make it a lot easier for uh, New Yorkers to get on the path to an apprenticeship uh, program and, and, and get a ticket to the middle class. So I'm a firm believer uh, that this is going to do a lot of good in the city. We have an affordable housing crisis. Everything seems to be going up. The cost of living here is astronomical. We, if we want a fairer city and a more affordable city, we have to find a way to get people more access to good paying jobs. And we know that uh, an apprenticeship program and ultimately uh, a union card is a ticket uh, for so many people and a lifeline once they get it. So, um, you know, this is not strictly a union bill. We kind of outlined that in some of our talking points and memorandum that we sent around to my uh, colleagues. But um, as I mentioned, it is just going to make it a little bit easier for uh, working, working people and working New Yorkers to get 
uh, compensated properly, and that's really what this is all about. I am happy to uh, work with my colleagues to address any of the MWBE issues that uh, obviously uh, have arisen over the past uh, couple of weeks. Uh, we certainly want to address those uh, head on and make sure that we're not disenfranchising anybody, uh, particularly from the people who could benefit the most uh, from a union job. We certainly want to help them uh, the most, so um, we're going to be working on that. But I think that this hearing is very important, and hopefully uh, we can iron out all the kinks and pass the bill, and we'd love to have the administration's support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We've been joined by Council Member Helen Rosenthal. Uh, does the bill sponsor have any initial questions, or I can go to... No, please, uh, please continue the hearing. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal for questions. Thank you so much, Chuck Kalos. Thank you, uh, really, to everyone who's here, and thank you, Councilmember Elrich, for bringing this discussion uh, here. You know, um, as many of you know, I've been working um, with the administration to make it easier for MWBEs to get contracts, and we've thought hard about the different ways to do that uh, through the advisory committee, and we've implemented some of those changes, you know, DVC breaking up contracts into smaller bits and pieces, and so we can watch the MWBEs have access to the lower dollar amounts, but then grow into the medium and so on. Um, would there be a way, and I, I appreciate uh, the bill sponsor's comments just now, to exempt MWBs or to understand better how it could help the MWBs? I see some testimony coming that says it could be helpful to the MWBs, but I don't know. What do you, th what do you think? Hi, Chair Emeritus, how are you? So I, I think that, you know, as uh, the sp chief sponsor has shared and our testimony suggests, um, we have to work very closely with the advisory committee, as you know, uh, to think about where the right, uh, the sweet spot would be. Um, Mr. Lepari er earlier shared, you know, that there are a number of infrastructure things you need to put in place to make sure you support these programs really well. We've found that, you know, as you said, in the one million to three million range is where a lot of MWBEs are doing really well. So we don't want to introduce any new barriers. I think I would have to work more closely with you and the committee and bring together MWBEs to talk through um, what, uh, you know, new things might be introduced if we're thinking of lowering or uh, adjusting where the current threshold is. Um, I, I'm not sure about exemption uh, per se, that could be an option. Um, but I, I would say that how this has come about in the past was as a part of the more global negotiations around the PLAs. Um, there are a number of factors that are considered there. So um, I would want to work really closely with the law department and others who are uh, currently uh, working with uh, the trades, labor, um, and MWBEs to think more carefully over the next uh, couple weeks with what this might mean. So I don't have a, a, a just one answer for you. I think you have to consider the entire totality and not um, introduce any new barriers for MWBEs. And I'm sure uh, the committee chair asked this earlier, but do you have a sense of numbers, given that the categories are one to five million right now, do you have a sense of the numbers of MWBEs in that category and then a proportion, proportion of, you know, what the total is and what proportion are MWBEs? So Sorry if that was already said. Yeah, so just to, in the one to three million dollar range, just looking back at the past five fiscal years, in the one to three million dollar range, MWEs, prime contracts for uh, total construction, about 25% of the, the prime contracts. Mm. But then once you get above, uh, you know, five to seven and a half million dollar range, it goes to 16% and then you know, Got it. It goes down over. Got it. So, so about 25%. And is that in dollars or is that in number of firms? That is in, in dollars, in total construction in value, the percentage of prime contract registered dollars. How many firms is that? And how many of the firms are dupes? In other words, I get several. So I don't have in front of me the unique number of firms, but we can follow up with data on that. I think that'd be really interesting. And then interesting to know of those firms are they getting, how, you know, how many, what's the end? You know, how many are getting one, how many are two, three, four, et cetera? Sure, yeah, we can Without, uh, totally anonymized, but 
Um, that would, I think that'd be helpful to yeah. figuring this out. Yeah, and I think we can take a look at that and, and share that with you as Great. following up. Great, so if that's 25%, so what's the total dollar amount? So this is specifically in that range. Yeah, um, one to three. In the one to three, there's about a uh, $270 million of prime contract in that range, and that's over yeah, the past that's five, minimal. five years. So that's five years of uh, data from fiscal oh. year 14 through f fiscal year 18. Okay, so how it's much how much then is remaining for the non-MWBE? So in that in that range again, there's about seven hundred and eighty-five million dollars for some of the non-MWBEs. It's about right, but okay, twenty-five percent of that though is MWBE, right? Is the two seventy the two seventy is the MWBE portion. Oh. the total amount is about it's about a billion dollars. So oh, it's about that's what I was asking. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. And so similarly, if you could do the numbers for the remaining seventy-five percent number of contractors and how many get multiple different multiples. Thank you so much. Thank you to the bill sponsor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to apologize again. I m actually missed your testimony, but I've been reading it and trying to get through it as uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Councilmember Roosevelt, was asking questions. Um, what is the primary concern that the administration has uh, regarding uh, capacity issues if this bill is passed? Um, would this affect capacity? for uh, non-unionized MWBE companies? Uh, do, do, are they, is the administration concerned? What, what type of support is the administration providing for those uh, companies? And if we were to pass the bill, um, what type of support would uh, the city provide for uh, established uh, MWBEs to, you know, to set up an apprenticeship program? Because it's going to cost a little bit of money, right? So that w what is the administration doing and what are they prepared to do? So as we mentioned, the apprenticeship directive has historically been uh, one piece of a broader conversation that the city's had with labor, and we're currently, in fact, discussing um, PLAs with the unions and the various stakeholders, including contractor associations, MWBEs, and small businesses. So we are in conversations now and discussing um, the, the various efforts that the city can take and partner with our partners um, to really you know help support everyone who may be impacted by the the future of what we ultimately land on but those conversations are active and ongoing with um, respect to the current project labor agreements that exist for instance in the department of Ed, uh, education or the sca i know that there's one that's probably the, the one that most people are familiar with um, isn't there a quota uh, for uh, the workforce development portion of that uh, PLA uh, in terms of what that workforce actually looks like, hiring from the community. We hear a lot about that. Is there one standard uh, currently? I mean, that certainly we want to diversify the trades as much as we can, get you know, regular New more New Yorkers into an apprenticeship program, especially when there's a, pr a project labor agreement that's been signed. But what, what is the standard, if you could just, you know, explain yeah, that? Yeah, so his, historically, in the past PLAs, and it's not speaking to the, the future one, there's been an agreement between the Building Trades and the Building Trades Employers Association in the city about um, ensuring that more New Yorkers of different categories get access to the apprenticeship program and into the union, so not completely related to who's working on the jobs, but access to the trade. So a certain percentage of women, a certain percentage of high school students, a certain percentage of veterans, et cetera. So that's the um, relationship that's existed to date. And, and is, there a, is there one standard? Like what, what is the standard for a contractor uh, who's a union shop who wants to rebuild, who gets a contract to rebuild the gymnasium in a public school, you know, and he, and he has to, he or she has to hire, let's say, a hundred, have a hundred people work on that particular project. What is the breakdown? What does that look like? So there's, um, there's only workforce requirements on certain contracts. So there's the requirement that it be union and it be a PLA contract or um, affiliated with a, a, a letter of whatever it's called. Um, but generally, um, contracts don't have workforce requirements. So federal contracts have specific workforce requirements. 
um, through Executive Order 11246, which talks about diversity by trade and a women percentage. The Sandy recovery contracts, we had a percentage for 20% um, Sandy impacted residents working on that. And um, NYCHA and other HUD funded contracts have a Section 3 requirement, but generally there's not a, currently a workforce requirement on contracts. You know, one of the concerns that I have is that for contractors, any contractor who bids on a city uh, project, whether it's a parks department project or uh, something for school construction authority, they have to pay prevailing wages anyway, right? And a lot of times, not a lot of times, but too often, I'll revise that, uh, we see or hear about instances of wage theft where, where they're falsifying payroll reports, um, and, and I know that those are the exceptions to the rule. I'm not saying that all the people that are bidding on contracts are doing that or guilty of that, but it, it becomes increasingly difficult for the controller's office and for the city to monitor, investigate, and then reprimand or hold accountable those people who are taking advantage of, of the workers, of the working men and women uh, who are being underpaid and they're stealing their wages. It's terrible. It's criminal. Um, you know, that really does not exist uh, when you have the uh, apprenticeship programs because it, there are so many other checks that are put into place um, and oversight that happens. It's not just about, you know, worrying about is the controller going to certify the payroll or, uh, you know, are they going to renew my MWBE uh, license uh, to operate and to bid on projects in the city. But, you know, they, they, they could go to jail. They could be, uh, if, if a union shop does that, there are many more, um, consequences, if you will, for that. So I, I and, and you see that there's less of that going on in those established apprenticeship programs and in those, uh, and among those union companies. I cer again, I, I don't want this bill to be passed to the detriment of MWBEs, and I want to work with my colleagues to address the concerns that they have, and then if we can make any changes to the bill, I'm very much open to doing that. But at the same time, I don't want to lock out job security and protection for workers, for working men and women who are a part of these uh, contracts. And, uh, and I think that this, this might be another way to safeguard. Sometimes when, when, when companies bid on city work, they will purposely underbid. We know this, right? I mean, like the materials cost X, the labor, the prevailing wages established. We know what that is. And uh, there are seven companies that bid on a new school. and. Six of them are all within 100,000 or 200,000, and then there's one that comes in at $350,000 less. Well, how, how did that company come in uh, at less? Obviously, they're doing something wrong, and then you know they get the contract, and then we find out later on that uh, we know what they were doing wrong. They were they were taking advantage of their of their workers. I just I think we need to put into place more protections for uh, the workforce, and also the with respect to safety the uh, training that the apprenticeship programs provide in-house are really second to none, and that, that can only benefit the city's workforce. Last year, I, th I think there were almost 20 construction-related deaths. I, I don't know the exact number. Was it more or less than that? I don't recall off the top of my head, but I know it was a high number. And anything that we can do to improve safety on these job sites, I think, is, is really important. We want to make sure that that uh, New Yorkers are safe and that they're properly compensated. I think this is a way to do that and also to bring a lot of the MWBEs into the apprenticeship program and have them um, become part of that family, if you will. So, uh, I mean, what, what are some of the other concerns? I, again, I missed your, your back and forth earlier. What, what were some of the other concerns that were articulated by the administration regarding the bill as it is, as it currently is? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's concerns as much about the bill. We support very much apprenticeship programs and the apprenticeship directive um, and you know just the process that we've come to issue the apprentice directive in 2015 and the process we're going through now um, is kind of an ongoing conversation with labor with the contractor community and we did it kind of in parallel with the PLA last time so for us um, we want that to be part of the process and now we're looking at that specifically our office, the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development, really wants to ensure that more New Yorkers get access to these apprenticeships and get on the work that the city's doing. We're just not sure if legislation, especially while all of these other negotia negotiations are going on, is it's kind of the right time or the right place to do this. I just, I, I, would, I would rather not leave it to the mercy of, of whoever the mayor happens to be. Who knows if 
the next mayor may not be so friendly to uh, organized labor. I mean, I'm just throwing that out as a hypothetical. And then if this bill is not passed and we don't have something on the books, you know, we're at the mercy of, of wh whatever the mayor's relationship with the uh, building trades is. And I don't, think that, I, don't think that's, I don't think that's fair. I think it's rather arbitrary um, in that regard. So I think having a law and having the threshold and lowering it, I think, is, is, uh, is important. Yeah, I, I, I think what we're, we're advocating for here is that the labor negotiations are happening now, right? And uh, as, as you know, uh, so since th once that gets codified, that is the project labor agreement uh, that would exist between labor and the administration, uh, in, and we want to make sure that we go through the process, um, we did not unilaterally uh, r lower or raise the threshold last time it was a part of those negotiations. So. What we're essentially saying is that that's, that's part of the place where we want to make sure that we're looking at all the various factors, um, and that's in progress right now. Well, we certainly don't want to interfere with the collective bargaining process. We don't want to, um, we don't want to interfere with that. I understand that. But uh, this bill has a supermajority of support among my colleagues, and uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting people on the bill. Some people don't even agree with each other politically. You'll see that they're on this bill because they understand uh, how important it is, and, and unfortunately they themselves have experienced situations where the Parks Department or other agencies uh, awarded certain contracts to certain uh, individual companies and projects were delayed, there was shoddy work being done, people were hurt on the job side, people were underpaid. I mean, I, I could name three or four just off the top of my head uh, in Queens alone. Uh, so. You know, again, changing this and sort of codifying into law, I think, it, it is more of a preventative measure. It's, it's not meant to interfere with the city's ongoing negotiations, just so. C certainly. And I think you, you covered it in, in your opening remarks. You've acknowledged that we need to work closely with MWBEs and small businesses. Um, and I think uh, since you're open to that process um, right now, uh, we'd like to continue that th thinking about this with you. So please feel free to uh, work with the chair and myself and our, uh, the committee council here. Uh, because we're very eager to pass this bill, and uh, God willing, but uh, the point is we want to make sure that it, it's, it, it is not com you know, seen as being completely detrimental to MWBEs. We want to work and encourage more participation in the workforce among uh, the, those companies, and uh, anything that we can do to facilitate that, I'm, I'm very much open to it, but I do believe that we are going to pass something. So if you can help us make it better, love to have your participation. Uh, if you don't, <laughs> we're going to pass it anyway. So just <laughs> work with us. So <laughs> we got a veto-proof majority. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just want to echo the bill sponsor's uh, sentiment, and I am a co-prime sponsor as well. But uh, you're welcome to try to negotiate with project labor agreements, but we're not affected by that, and we will pass it regardless of where you are in that process. And additionally, to the extent uh, you already have participation of MWBEs who are able to meet apprenticeships, uh, we're through the rest of the hearing. I hope to educate anyone watching on TV or concerned uh, about MWBEs just how easy it is to access apprenticeship as an employer. Uh, so I'm going to excuse this panel. I'm just going to share with folks that this is the stack of testimony we've already received. Uh, so it's a lot. I'm going to put a five-minute clock on folks, and uh, please do your best to uh, confine your remarks to five minutes. You don't have to use the full five minutes. I want to note uh, that uh, we are joined by the New York State laborers, uh, from New York State laborers by uh, Vinny Albanese, uh, but uh, we will be having from Labor's Local 1010, Lowell Barton. Uh, full disclosure, I believe we served on Community Board 8 together at one point, and uh, I appoint members of labor to community boards, and if you are a member of labor, please consider reaching out to your council member and your borough president to be appointed. You can contact the Central Labor Council, who has an entire program about getting labor on community boards. Also, we have uh, Charles from the Carpenters. Uh, uh, not, not, forgive me for mispronouncing this, Nathud, and uh, Katie uh, from the Carpenters. For the first panel, please come on up. It's, it's Katie Shane from the Carpenters.
while this uh, panel is coming up. If you're uh, watching at home or uh, afterwards, you have uh, 72 hours from today, September 23rd, to submit testimony. Uh, and you can email that to contracts at bencalos.com. And we're going to need one more chair up at the, uh, at the table. And, uh, well, that, that'll be all yours. They're bringing, you, they're bringing you a chair. Don't worry about it. The laborers uh, wish to begin. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Chair Powell. Can you move it closer? Start over. Is the red light on? Yes. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chair Callos, and all council, council members present. My name is Lowell Barton. I am the Vice President and Organizing Director for Labor's Local 1010. A local union representing over 1,800 members, I'm here to express our staunch support of Intro 674 legislation, reducing the apprenticeship directive required by the Mayor's Office of Contract Services from $3 million to $1 million. I want to ta thank Chair Kalos and the Contracts Committee for hosting this important meeting. At Local 1010, we feel the legislation will benefit workers, contractors, and taxpayers. Requiring certified apprenticeship programs ensures workers receive the necessary training to keep themselves, their co-workers, and the general public safe. Construction is an inherently dangerous occupation, making it imperative to receive proper training. Additionally, we feel this legislation will benefit small contractors by leveling the playing field and eliminating bad actors from the bidding process. Contractors that participate in certified apprenticeship programs oftentimes have lower instances of default, disqualification, and or debarment. Um, Local 1010s works with a number of smaller contractors, including MWBEs. There are over 50 signatory MWBEs to Local 1010. These contractors participate in our apprentice programs, and a number of them have provided memos of support for Intro 674. These contractors include Gateway Demo Civil Corporation, HHJR Construction Limited, Padilla Construction Services, VIF Corp, Prestige Pavers of New York Incorporated, Prima Paving Corp, Nihal Contracting, and Deborah Bradley Construction and Management Services, to name a few. These MWBs also benefit from having a well-trained and skilled workforce. Efficiency is increased, reducing the duration of the project and reducing ongoing costs. In addition to benefiting contractors, um, Intro 674 will assist in creating a pipeline for more New York City residents to access careers in the construction and industry. By reducing the threshold to $1 million, more workers will have access to apprenticeship training, allowing them to gain necessary skill set to have a lifelong career as a tradesperson. The Bill and Trades works with a number of pre-apprenticeship programs that will be able to place more of the members in apprenticeship programs. Non-traditional non employment for women is in strong support of this legislation. Recognizing the benefit of this legislation will have for bolstering the number of women in the trades. For these reasons, I urge the City Council to swiftly pass Intro 674. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Kalos and all the council members present uh, for hosting this hearing on legislation that will make a significant impact on the construction industry and the greater New York City community. Uh, my name is Katie Shane. I'm the Deputy Political Director at the NYC District Council of Carpenters. Uh, the New York City District Council of Carpenters is a representative body comprised of nine individual locals and 20,000 members. We promote a culture of safety. Every day we work to make sure our members are properly trained as construction safety is our biggest concern. We care about every one of our members and the risk is too great to not invest in safety training annually. Therefore, our members receive formal and ongoing training on health and safety risks. Construction is a dangerous occupation and construction in New York City presents unique hazards to workers and to community members. According to the New York City Department of Buildings, as of June 2019, 12 construction workers have died while working on job sites. The New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health, NICOSH, issued a report in June outlining that falls continue to be the top cause of construction fatalities and injuries. In the last 10 years in New York City, 
78 workers died due to falls, which accounted for 40% of construction deaths. The second largest contributor to construction industries is being struck by an object. 8% of construction workers' deaths in 2017 were caused by falling debris or, sus or suspended load striking workers. This is not only a danger to workers, but to people who may be injured from objects falling onto the sidewalk or street. Although our organization represents unionized carpenters, this is not a union versus non-union issue. Intro 674 would lower the apprenticeship threshold, effectively increasing the amount of training received by all workers on New York City construction sites. Reports conclude that training is one of the most effective strategies for reducing injuries and fatalities on job sites. In a study published by the Journal for Workforce Education and Development, researchers found that job sites with trained workers received significantly less OSHA violations than job sites with untrained workers. Additionally, in a report by NICOSH, 79% of New York City job site accidents in which a worker fell and died were at non-union sites. Union sites are safer than non-union sites because they require apprenticeship programs with OSHA courses and training for shop stewards to oversee work sites. Having a well-trained workforce does not only increase, increase safety, but also enhances the capacity, efficiency, and productivity of all contractors. We strongly support Introduction 674 and want to see the current apprenticeship threshold for New York City projects lowered, as has been done in other municipalities throughout New York State. We urge you to pass Introduction 674. And I'd like to pass it on to the real experts, uh, some of our members of the New York City District Council of Carpenters. Good afternoon. Thank you, K Chair Kalos, and all council pres present. My name is Nathan Panama, and I am a member of Local 1556 of the New York City and Vicinity District Council of Carpenters. I have, I've been a member of the union for 15 years and a shop steward for the last year. Being a member of this union has taught me how to do my job safely. My apprenticeship training gave me four years of in-classroom and job site instructions. When I go to work, I am not afraid I won't come home at the end of the day. Every worker should feel, should be able to share that feeling. Workers should not fear going to work. Construction is a dangerous job and there is no substitute for proper training. It is a job requires instructions before performing even the most basic tasks. I cannot imagine walking onto a job site without training. Every safety course I have taken was necessary for a safe work environment for myself, my co-workers, and the public. Now I am a shop steward where I make sure everyone on the job site is safe. I also get past all my knowledge as a 15-year member to the younger generation. Safety is my most important concern. So intro 674 will make sure that all workers have access to training to make sure they are safe. I am proud to be a construction worker and I, and I am proud to be of the training I have received. I am proud of the certifications I have earned. My hope is that all workers can provide, can be provided with the same opportunity. Thank you for taking the time to consider my testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Kellos and council members present. My name is Charles Bullock. I am a member and shop steward for Local 926 for the New York City District Council of Carpenters. I've been a member for about 15 years. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Brownsville, Brooklyn. I care very, very, very deeply about my community and keeping my community safe. I'm a member of my local community board. Um, I am chairman of my edu education committee for the um, community board number five of East New York. I know that training saves lives. Job, job sites that receive little to no training, workers fear, fear those environments that they work in. Most of the, mo the most common injury is death of fall. Accidents like this are preventable with, with proper training by apprenticeship programs. On these non-union sites, they limit the training of workers not wearing the proper harnesses. When harnesses are, are, aren't worn, workers are in danger of their lives. Simply tying off with a lanyard or a on their harness can um, prevent fatalities. Plenty of fatalities occurred this, occur, occurred this year. 
as a shop steward, I oversee projects where, where members are working on. I make sure that my members are very safe. It is my job to halt work when, when something's unsafe, like a broken ladder or insecure harness. I know that as a shop steward, I have a big responsibility and um, keeping these workers safe is my livelihood. I took off work today to testify before you because the Carpenter Apprenticeship has changed my life. I wake up every day proud to go to work and to provide for my family. I know that work, that working and returning home safely is very vital to me. I hope that you guys keep the apprenticeship programs going because it keeps people in my community hopeful of something that, that can happen in the future. Having a job like a union job could definitely help the middle class. Intro 674 would increase how many workers would be in, inside these apprenticeship programs. It's very vital. I want more members of my community to have access to these jobs. And I think by passing this legislation, it will make things more possible for, for my community. Um, thank you for taking time to listen to my testimony. Thank you very much to this distinguished panel, as well as the fact that uh, half this panel serves on the community boards. Uh, it is a uh, strong indication, uh, and uh, I want to see more. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to apologize. I'm actually really, really sick today, but this was too important to miss. Uh, so I guess one question I just wanted to talk about, because I don't think many people know about what a shop steward is, particularly folks at home. So if you can share what the difference between not having a shop steward is versus having a shop steward, what are some of the times that you would have gone to a shop steward as you were starting as you were an apprenticeship in an, w while you were an apprentice, and what are some of the times that you as a uh, shop steward have been called upon, and in what ways has that resulted in a safer situation on the job site? Okay, um, as a shop steward, um, my job is very important. I'm responsible for payroll, making sure that these workers have benefits every day that they go to work, um, make sure that they're safe on the job site, that they're not mistreated, um, I take pride in doing my job every day as a shop steward because as an apprentice, I, I really didn't have much direction. But as becoming a shop steward, I see the importance of my job and making sure everybody's safe and paid correctly. Hi, um, the same statement, Mr. Charles, but all, and also when I go to many companies when they're when the workers are company guys and they're afraid to speak up, they let me know and I can help them in any issues they, they may have. Where there is any type of concerns, like it's the same thing that Mr. Charles says, and also when it comes to especially to, the, to their hours because they need their health care benefits for their families. So that's one of the main concerns that they have. And they ask me, how do I report this? How do I go by this? What steps do I take? And I can help them with that. Have either of you ever been on a construction site where the uh, developer GC was saying, we want you to do something and workers felt it was dangerous and workers brought it to your attention and you were able to intervene? Uh, yes, it usually happens once a month. So can, can you, <laughs> so it, I appreciate the fact that everyone in the room is, is, is laughing about yeah. the frequency of the occurrence. But, but it is no laughing matter. Can you give us just an example? Please don't mention any particular employers, but okay. what, what are we talking about here is, is that folks are raising a safety concern to you? Okay. Um, well, my main job is scaffold or bridging. Um, when there's not enough people, sometimes it gets a little unsafe to do a, a big job with not enough members, not enough carpenters. Like in scaffolding frames, Instead of passing it, uh, instead of having a member in each frame, we have to then skip a frame, and then we have to throw materials from one member to the next one down, and that 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 can be dangerous. A lot of people get get hurt many times. A lot of and there's always a lot of those people. Uh, even no matter how prepared you are with your uh, PPE, you still somehow get hurt a little bit at least. 
And it happened on the job site when the job was, we did half the job, then we were able to put one member in each couple. The, so the supervisor said, okay, I want half the members now go to, to go do another job. And I stopped the supervisor and said, listen, we are safe now. Let's finish the job first and then move on to the next one. And there was a little discussion about it, but I finally was able to get it on my side. And how does apprenticeship training inform you in those situations and inform you in knowing what's safe and what isn't? Well, um, we have OSHA 10 and OSHA 30 classes that are very informative and they give us information that we need to go out on the field so we can work safely. Um, but doing those classes is one thing, but being out in the field is another thing. And that's the importance of having a shop steward there. When you're an apprentice, you go out there with a lot of energy. Um, the, the shop steward gives you a little bit more direction of w what's to come, you know? But um, having this training in apprenticeships is very vital. Thank you. A uh, question to Local 1010. If uh, any employer and any, any company was bidding on road work and uh, they did not currently have an apprenticeship program uh, and they approached Local 1010, could they gain access to an apprenticeship program for their existing employees and would they pay, would the employer have to pay you directly or would it come from the employee payroll? Well, when, the, uh, when a contractor bids and they want to become union, they just sign a contract. That's it. And um, from that point on, um, the only... So the, the contractor would just sign up with us and uh, we would send them with skilled workers. We uh, often accept the contractor's workers and welcome them to our training program to get them up to speed. Um, we have a steward there to make sure that, you know, if they do need training, we point it out they need it. But, uh, yeah, it doesn't really cost anything. As a matter of fact, it saves money because union contractors, your insurance goes down. And with a prevailing wage job, a contractor who's non-union has to pay the wages and the benefit weekly to the employee as opposed to the wage and you could pay the benefit within 30 to 90 days, uh, they're, they're compliant. And with that said, you have more working capital and you have less payroll taxes. So you're, you're, there's a savings, there's a clear savings for contractors who uh, are signatory and that's why we're so competitive. Um, it helps a lot, and especially with injuries, and, and you know, if you have workforce injuries on as a bidding contractor and you have a history of it, a lot of the agencies won't even consider your bids. So, so again, I'm gonna ask this one more time. So there was a lot of conversation from the first panel. One of my colleagues was asking questions. Um, can, so can anyone sign a, a collective bargaining agreement? Yes. And once they sign that collective, do they have to pay money to sign the collective bargaining agreement? No. no. So they sign a collective bargaining agreement. You start training their existing workers. Correct. And then you can provide them with additional skilled workers. Correct. <clears throat> and then it just comes from those workers' payrolls. Correct. Yes. Okay, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm lost when folks are talking to me about the fact that they, they don't have the expertise to do this. It sounds like if they don't have the expertise and they need help, they can actually just go to the union that's doing the type of work that they're doing and just sign a collective bargaining agreement. Yes, it's, it's that simple. And they actually save money with the insurance and they save money with the payroll tax and they usually succeed very well. And then they would there would be a shop steward on the site to try to help folks. So. All in all, it, it, all, it, it provides assistance. Uh, so th those are my questions. I'll turn it over to the bill sponsor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to uh, single out Mr. Barton and the laborers union in particular. They've really been leading the charge on this issue. Uh, and, and, and they're leading it not because it's, it's going to increase their membership by tenfold or that it's going to only benefit them. They know that this is going to benefit every single worker uh, that is on one of these construction sites. It's going to make them safer. It's going to make sure they're compensated properly, that they have a level of job security, and, and, um, and again, a ticket to the middle class. So I want to thank you, uh, Lowell, for your advocacy and your persistence on this matter because I don't think uh, without it we would even be here having this hearing today. 
So I want to thank you for that. You're welcome, Eric. I want to uh, ask a question that I uh, am very interested in. What changes do you think we could make to the bill or modifications that could address some of the concerns that people have regarding the lack of uh, minority participation in the uh, in the apprenticeship programs? What what protections or what what could we build into the legislation that maybe isn't there or isn't quite as clear that could address some of the concerns that the administration has that this is somehow going to disenfranchise MWBE contractors? I don't think anybody wants to do that. That's not the goal of the bill. No, and uh, I, you know I would love to be a part of that conversation with the MWBEs. I don't know if there's any in this room, but there there are so many advantages that aren't looked at. Uh, if I, you know we have a large amount of. WMBE contractors, I as a as a, in the field work for them, and and the success rate in con construction is um, the skill of your workforce, uh, the the skill that you have in management, the experience that you have. And right now, I think the way the directive is, thirty percent of all contracts WMBEs as subcontractors is is a very proactive and uh, and and I, you know it brings great. Uh, but that doesn't affect these jobs because most of our contractors they do some contracting and they're covered by a collective bargain agreement anyway. And also as a WMBE contractor, as a subcontractor, that is the largest market that they have. It's, it, contracts require subcontracts to MWBs at 30%. Um, if you have a bad contractor, GC, bidding a job that has no experience and has no pressure, MBEs probably aren't gonna get paid at the end of the day when they go under a default or you know, when they're not able to make payroll. So there is a lot of positive that good contractors bring. And I, I see right now that under the directive, they've grown the MWB, where 25% may look like a, a low number, but it was a lot better than it was five years ago. Um, and the opportunities are there written into every contract. And that's happened, and I, I think that directive is great. And it's almost to the point where there's not enough of them registered yet. Um, so I think to help WBEs, would be just getting more of them ex with the experienced workforce, able to complete the job on time, and to try to get eliminate some of those bad general contractors who are not paying them, because that's one sure way for an MWB to be out of business. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand the concern that the Helen Rosenthal uh, raised with me uh, privately and also at the hearing. I think she tried to articulate some of those points. We certainly don't want to disenfranchise anybody or, or make it seem as though this bill is meant to cut any MWBE out of the competitive bidding process. We don't want to do that. Um, if there was any language or anything that we can insert in the bill, we're going to work very closely with the trades um, and, um, and to make sure that those protections are put in place. But we are eager to pass the bill. We know how beneficial this is going to be. And also, quite frankly, for the quality of the construction. I mean, I've known so many uh, projects, for instance, that were completed by um, uh, companies uh, with the Parks Department, for instance, or, or this even the sidewalk contracts to fix broken sidewalks in my district. And when I was first elected 10 years ago, we had a, a put in a large sum of money to help my constituents. This is in the prior administration. And uh, it had to be put out to bid three separate times. It took over three years just to find a contractor who was qualified and vetted and met all of the requirements and could actually uh, have the capacity to do the work. One uh, contractor, the first one, was actually thrown out of the city's system. He was convicted on something else and unrelated to that particular project. Uh, the next one lacked the capacity, and, and, and I think the third one lied. And then they finally... Uh, coupled it with a couple of other contracts and that's how we were able to move it out and, and get the work done. And this is just a very simple, it was like a million dollar contract for uh, fixing people, you know, 400 sidewalks in my district for seniors and homeowners that would otherwise have to pay for it themselves. Um, the current system that the city is using for some of these smaller contracts, well, they're not so small, but the city would consider it small, is uh, not uh, efficient, it's not consistent, and sometimes n not only is it <coughs> dangerous for the workers, but the work is not that good, the final product. I think that if we pass this bill, we're, we're going to see a lot, of, uh, a lot of projects move, you know, more quickly, and also uh, the work will be done uh, according to the spec, according to the building code, according to how it's supposed to actually be done. So, uh, you know, I'm very eager to pass this bill. 
uh, it's not intended to hurt any particular group or any particular contractors. We want to make the job site safer. We want consistency. Uh, we want more people entering the apprenticeship programs uh, and the benefits that they offer. And, um, and we want to hold the city accountable. Right now, it's like it's, we have project labor agreements with some agencies, but not with others. And, uh, and there's a lot of abuse going on right now. And I think that the administration uh, turns a blind eye to it. I think if we pass this bill, they won't be able to turn a blind eye because there'll be another layer of oversight that the union will be watching to make sure that, that, that their workers, the men and women who are on these sites, that they are safe, that the job is being done properly. I, I don't think that's a bad thing. It doesn't cost us anything. We're paying for it anyway in the prevailing wages. So I want to address whatever MWB concerns that they have. I want to work with my colleagues, the chair of the committee, um, and uh, also Helen Rosenthal to see if we can address some of that uh, and amend this bill. But I want to pass this bill. This has to get done. We can't leave this to the mercy of the mayor. I, I bring up the other point that we have. Who knows who the next mayor is going to be? It's not going to be me. Don't worry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh, I, we don't know who the next mayor is going to be, and, and we shouldn't leave uh, something as important as this uh, to the mercy of the of the mayor, whoever the mayor happens to be. It's not a good policy for the city of New York and for the working men and women of the city of New York. We just can't allow it. So, Mr. Chair, I'm going to do everything I can. Uh, to address those concerns, but we got to pass the bill. It's very, very important. Thank you again. Perfect. For your uh, just quick follow-ups for Carpenters, uh, K Katie and uh, Lowell at the Laborers. Can small businesses sign a collective bargaining agreement? Yes. Yes. Uh, can either of your labor organizations refuse somebody who wishes to, to sign a collective bargaining agreement? No, not unless they were like being arrested the following day or the day before okay. yesterday. Okay, yeah. so anyone, any size employer can sign a collective bargaining agreement. Uh, can a business owned by a woman sign a collective bargaining agreement? Yes. Absolutely, we actually uh, can, are proud can, of it too. We, we market can, them. Can a business owned by a person of color sign a collective bargaining agreement? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, is there any any discrimination that they face in being able to sign on to collective bargaining agreements that you're aware of? No. no. Okay. Uh, that's it for uh, Excuse me. I, I want to just make, make one comment. Yeah. Um, as far as diverse, diversifying the apprenticeship program, um, I'm thinking about implementing apprenticeship training into high schools in minority na neighborhoods. Yeah. Like um, Transit Tech High School, I've been speaking with a principal for Transit Tech High School and he's, he wants to sit down at the table and actually consider um, adding an apprenticeship program where these kids could receive some type of training in high school before they actually enter the apprenticeship so they can have a heads up of what they're getting into before they get into the union trades. So I just wanted to put that on the table as something for consideration. Count me in, I've been working on that. Uh, there's a high school called Co-op Tech which is across the street from my district and uh, been trying to work specifically at the request of the carpenters on how to do pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship so that uh, students, uh, particularly at-risk students and students who aren't interested in completing their studies in high school can start making quite a lot of money at uh, 16 and 17 as soon as they're legally allowed. Uh, thank you very much to this panel. You are excused. Our next panel is uh, Felice Farber from General Contractors Association, Melissa Shetlers from Pathways to Apprenticeship, uh, Carolyn Casau from the no, uh, for Non-Traditional Employment for Women, and uh, Manvel Castro from New Immigrant Community Empowerment, NICE. Uh, full, full just uh, disclosure, uh, one of the members of this panel is a constituent and therefore my boss. Uh, another member of this panel uh, oversees an organization uh, new where uh, one of my very close friends graduated and is uh, now a uh, plumber. So I want to thank them and uh, be fully disclosed about all the different ties I may have. You may begin whenever you wish. Good morning. 
I'm Felice Farber, uh, Senior Director of um, Policy and Government and External Affairs of the General Contractors Association. Thank you, Chairman Kalos, Councilmember Ulrich, and members of the Committee on Contracts for the opportunity to testify today in support of Intro 674. The GCA represents the heavy civil construction industry in New York City, whose members construct roads, New York's roads, bridges, transit, water and wastewater water systems, parks, schools, and building foundations. Our members are a diverse group, ranging from the largest national and international contractors to small family-owned businesses and minority and women-owned firms. The Council has made worker training and safety a priority, passing a number of bills that require extensive safety training, including Local Law 196. Intro 674 is another step in the right direction towards protecting workers. Through apprenticeship programs, workers learn a skilled trade, preparing them for careers in the construction industry. Through a combination of classroom instruction and on-the-job training, workers who participate in an apprenticeship program are better prepared for the workforce and are more successful in their careers. And I just want to um, bring up a couple of uh, points that were raised earlier and answer a couple of questions. Um, the construction industry is a skilled trade. Um, I think there's a perception that this is not a skilled workforce and that you can just bring in anybody off the street to do construction. Um, it, these are skilled workers, um, apprenticeship programs provide workers with the skills and the certifications and the training they need to perform a skill, whether that's being an iron worker or a dock builder um, or even a laborer. These are, these are skilled positions and I think it's important that workers get um, the training that provide them with the skills to perform that task and to do so in a safe manner. And they get extensive safety training um, through the apprenticeship program. So I think this should, should really be perceived as a worker protection bill. It also provides opportunity and access to good paying jobs. Um, and I think that's an important um, point is th through the apprenticeship program there's an opportunity for um, steady work and steady work in what are um, family sustaining wage jobs and I think that's critical and it, and it protects a wide um, diverse range of workers. Um, it also provides access to steady jobs and careers. Um, so that we're not talking about an itinerant workforce, we're, we're talking about um, really skilled, permanent um, jobs for workers that, that, um, that helps, um, it helps create a stable middle class workforce. And as for the MWB issue that has been raised, um, it really, it helps small firms, whether they're MWBEs or not MWBEs, scale up by having a, s a ready access to um, a pool of skilled workers so that they can take, go from the small job to gradually build up to a larger job um, and be able to handle that um, increase in work with a steady skilled workforce. And I think those are some important points that I just wanted to raise. So thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We're very much in support of this bill. Good afternoon. My name is Carolyn Casso. I am the Communications and Development Associate at Non-Traditional Employment for Women. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of NEW. NEW prepares, trains, and places women in careers in skilled construction, utility, and maintenance trades, and much more, helping women achieve economic independence for themselves and their families. NEW strongly supports Intro 674, which, promote, which, excuse me, which promises to create more opportunities for women to enter skilled trade careers. Apprenticeship, as our new graduate community of more than 3,000 will tell you, is the gold standard in construction employment, and the City of New York can deeply encourage it through this legislation. We applaud Layuna, Councilmember Kalos, and their partners for leading this important effort to open doors for more New Yorkers. More apprenticeship opportunities means the inclusion of more women and more people of color in the most robust and supportive career path in the industry. The city can make its own purchasing power an engine for creating more apprenticeship opportunities and fill the real industry need for skilled workers. Now there are dozens of challenges still facing women in construction as you can easily imagine and might have seen. Um, that's why we do what we do here at NEW. Women are often the last hired and the first fired have trouble obtaining bathroom access and proper safety gear, and of course face a culture that can be exclusionary based on antiquated gender bias. 
However, we know that we overcome those issues by bringing more women, especially women of color, into these great career paths. Representation means a fair shot and fair treatment. Job sites now aren't what I would call amazing for women in 2019, but they have improved drastically over the years because of more women pushing their way into the industry. That's not something for us to rest on. That's evidence for us to keep pushing for more women to enter the trades and to keep shifting the culture and dialogues happening in construction for the sake of equity. More women in apprenticeship and more women completing apprenticeship will directly bring about that future. We hope you will enact intro 674. Let's open doors to careers for those New Yorkers who otherwise would not have had the chance. Thank you very much. I think I have a red light. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time to hear my testimony. My name is Melissa Shetler. I'm the executive director of Pathways to Apprenticeship. We are a pre-apprenticeship program that provides training and placement in, in union construction apprenticeship programs. We recruit for our classes through a number of partnerships. For example, we work with the New York City Housing Authority, NYCHA, to provide career pathways to public housing residents. Additionally, nearly half of our participants come from the reentry community. And we work with our partners at the Osborne Association, at Get Out, Stay Out, at Federal Parole, and the Fortune Society, among others, to connect those coming home from incarceration with union construction career opportunities. Parolees are a particularly vulnerable population, easily exploited by unscrupulous contractors due to overly burdensome release rules, and they often don't have a voice in the workplace. We see apprenticeship and representation as key elements in protecting their rights, in increasing their safety on the job, and in reducing recidivism. Whether working in Coney Island or Far Rockaway, West Harlem, or Red Hook, or Brownsville, as the councilwoman was here earlier, Intro 674 will help us expand these opportunities to real middle class opportunities. An apprenticeship means safety. Apprentices are given thousands of hours of on-the-job and in-classroom training, and safety is key. And it's not enough, and this is really important given the new legislation, it's not enough to say you've required someone to take OSHA 30 and fall protection. It means giving them a voice on the job and the ability to go to their shop steward or their foreman when they see something dangerous without fear of being fired. Apprenticeship means representation. Apprenticeship means women have the opportunity to do the same job for the same pay. Lowering the MOX threshold from three million to one million will increase opportunities and open up more placement slots for more graduates of programs like Pathways to Apprenticeship, Non-Traditional Employment for Women, Rebuilding Together, and many of our other partners. Dwayne Towns is a graduate of our program who spent half his life behind bars. Since graduating, he's gone on to graduate his apprenticeship program. So I just want to be clear that apprentices don't stay apprentices. They do, in fact, graduate and become journey workers. Uh, not only did he graduate, but he's now a shop steward in the field, representing and protecting his brothers and sisters on the job. His success lifts up his family and his community. He teaches our pre-apprenticeship classes when he can. He attends our information sessions to help others navigate his path and to be a model of what is possible. He wanted to be here with us today, but he's at work. And that's exactly the kind of problem I like to have because it means we've succeeded. Let's make sure that our public dollars are leveraged to do the most public good. Let's pass Intro 674 and show that the city is truly invested in the safety and long-term career health of all New Yorkers. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Kalos and members of the Committee on Contracts. My name is Manuel Castro. I am the Executive Director of New Immigrant Community Empowerment, NICE. Uh, we are a Queens-based uh, nonprofit organization celebrating our 20th anniversary this week, actually. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I am here on behalf of our members, predominantly day laborers and immigrant construction workers. 
And uh, we are here to uh, express our strong support for intro 674. The bill would ensure more quality training for workers as more contractors would need to maintain apprenticeship agreements with programs registered and approved by the Department of Labor. Lowering the apprenticeship threshold would increase the level and amount of training receiving b received by all workers, which would open further opportunities for communities like ours who have been historically excluded from these transformative programs. We believe an apprenticeship program is one of the most effective pathways for the most vulnerable New Yorkers to build a career and at the same time support themselves and their families now and well into the future. Moreover, stronger apprenticeship requirements also improve the safety of all workers by reducing the number of bad actor contractors unwilling to invest in their workers' safe being and uh, safety. According to industry standards, as has previously been uh, noted, companies that do not have apprenticeship, apprenticeship programs tend to have greater default rates as well as higher rate of disqualification and disbarment. For these reasons, we urge you to pass intro 674, which will support the career development of so many New Yorkers, uh, but in particular those workers who have not historically uh, had the advantage of an apprenticeship as a plat platform from which to launch and develop their careers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions. We've been uh, joined by a council member, uh, Calman Yeager. Uh, he's actually uh, in three places at once. He had two hearings, and uh, he was actually here before we gaveled in. Uh, thank you and welcome. Uh, for uh, nice and new, do you have copies of your testimony for the record? Sure. Uh, the, the sergeant at arms will accept them from you if you can do that right now. I handed it in when I walked in. Perfect. If, we could, if you could bring the new testimony up. Uh, so I guess uh, my first question to Manuel uh, at NICE, uh, you're representing uh, new immigrants. If they're on job sites that aren't, uh, don't have apprenticeship, what typically happens with new immigrants? Uh, are they, what, what do their wages usually look like? What kind of training do they get before they get on the job site or once they are on the job site? What kind of injuries are we seeing amongst uh, new immigrants when they are on these job sites without, depending on their training and what have you? Uh, thank you for the question. Unfortunately, uh, new immigrants um, have some of the highest rates of injury and death at the workplace, at construction sites. Uh, and this is in large part because employers uh, uh, take advantage of uh, often their immigration status uh, and do not provide the adequate training or uh, equipment uh, in safety conditions to work at these sites. So unfortunately, we see a lot of uh, wage theft, a lot of uh, workplace abuse, and so so many of our members, uh, you know, deal with that on a daily basis. And certainly, this this would allow us to have more opportunities for members uh, to get the required training uh, and hopefully uh, work with good employers that are looking out for their safety. Give me one second, I'm just trying to review some testimony. Uh, Melissa, could you tell me a little bit more about uh, the, the opportunities? Uh, if you didn't have pathways to apprenticeship and uh, you weren't there working with Osborne Association, Get Out, Stay Out, Federal Parole and Fortune Society, what kind of opportunities would there be uh, in terms of uh, the fact that you are seeing people going from apprenticeship to graduating to having jobs? How important it is it to having a threshold where there's not only apprenticeship but jobs to continuing that pipeline uh, to and get people out of prison and at away from recidivism? Sure. So I think I hear two questions there. But one is yes. like obviously the more jobs that we create um, that are affiliated with apprenticeship, uh, the more spaces open up. Um, and apprenticeship recruitments are uh, overseen by the Department of Labor. And as many folks know, 
It's a state regulation, um, and it's a complex system. And so programs that are pre-apprenticeship programs um, help folks to navigate those processes and make sure they get direct entry into those programs. And that isn't just us in the pre-apprenticeship field, but that's our union partners who are really committed also to making sure that um, folks who are coming home and folks from communities um, who you know really need middle class jobs are able to access these middle class opportunities. So we are able to work, uh, just for one example, this morning I was over at Federal Parole um, where they had managed to get um, 10 uh, numbers through the lottery system, the way that the Department of Labor runs this, for um, the Laborers Local 731, very excited group of people going in for an interview. Um, however, this community for themselves might have felt blind to what that interview might look like. Um, Fortunately, because the laborers and other unions are very invested in people's ability to navigate this process, I'm able to go in and answer their questions, and I'm able to write letters of recommendation based upon my conversations with them to really give that extra navigation point um, so that people are not excluded from these opportunities, and therefore, the more opportunities that exist, the more folks can, can make this pathway theirs. A uh, question for General Contractors Association. In your testimony, you mentioned that uh, you have, uh, and I quote, uh, GCA members are a diverse group ranging from the largest national and international contractors to small family-owned and minority and women-owned firms. Uh, can you develop more about that last portion? A significant amount of concern has been expressed about access to apprenticeship for MWBEs. What are, you, what are you seeing in your membership uh, in terms of what barriers there are or, or not? And uh, yes. So at the GCA, we're a 100% union organization. So all of our members are signatory to the union agreements. But the benefit of joining an association for whatever that trade is that you work in is that you it helps you navigate those um, union agreements and whatever the workforce issues are. Um, so it, if you're a building contractor, there's an association for that. If you're a plumber or electrician, there are associations for that. Um, the association can help smaller businesses and MWBEs really manage what that union relationship is, their representation on um, and dealing with grievances or any um, jurisdictional disputes or issues like that. that really helps, I think, provide opportunities for MWBEs to be more successful. Um, in addition, because we are a union organization or represent union contractors, um, having MWBEs that, are, um, that participate in um, apprenticeship programs and are signatories to the union contracts, I think, really provides them more opportunities and more opportunities to grow into being um, larger contractors. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the key elements is the ability to scale up the workforce um, as you grow and being able to handle bigger scopes of work and to be able to handle both small and larger projects. And I think one of the things that being um, a participant in a, in a union agreement is it does provide you that access um, to that skilled workforce and allows you to scale up and take on um, ever larger components of work. Is it with, would it be within GCA's mission or purview or even just courtesy if there are MWBEs that have concerns about this legislation to, to, to be a resource to them to see how they could not only work through this but thrive uh, through this legislation work to become law? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things we do is um, encourage MWBEs I if they do heavy civil work, which is the scope of of um, what GCA members do is to join the association um, so we can help provide them with the guidance, but certainly we can answer any questions um, and help out anyone on what their, their issues. And I think one of the things that could be helpful are training programs um, that um, the city could provide or various associations could provide that really explains what it means to work union um, and provide that assistance um, in helping the, the firms understand what it means, and, and not just union, because obviously we've talked today about the variety of apprenticeship opportunities, 
well, what it means to have worked through an apprenticeship program or to be um, or to participate in an apprenticeship program and what those opportunities are. And perhaps that could be through um, small business services that provides a lot of training programs for MWBEs. Uh, last question for this panel goes to non-traditional employment for women new. Uh, what, how many uh, women are entering the apprenticeship program every year? How many are graduating from it? And uh, if we were to pass this, would it increase the amount of apprenticeships available and your throughput? Uh. Sure, thank you for your question. Um, so <coughs> our programs team can definitely follow up with specifics on numbers for each year. But in the past 10 years alone, and we've been around for 41 years as of this spring, uh, 2,700 new graduates have secured employment as union apprentices in a variety of trades. Um, the other question you had was regarding placement. What did you, can you repeat Placement the and whether or not if this were made a local law, whether or not that would increase your throughput and the number of women who could enter the trades. I definitely believe it would, yes. Thank you. I'd like to excuse this panel. We have two more panels. Uh, the next panel has, uh, hold on one second. Next panel will be, uh, sorry, we're going to have th three more panels. Next panel will be from Rebuilding Together. Uh, we will have uh, Robin from Rebuilding Together, uh, Jassan from uh, Rebuilding Together, and uh, Tanisha uh, from Rebuilding Together. The uh, And uh, we will add to that panel uh, Jamel Dickerson. So good afternoon. Sorry, we'll, we'll also throw Alex Gleason on this panel if he is still here. You may begin. So good afternoon, um, Chair Kalos and the other uh, council members. My name is Robin Brown. I am the director of the Workforce Training Program at Rebuilding Together NYC. Uh, Rebuilding Together is actually located within the Gowanus uh, Red Hook area. We serve candidates in all five boroughs. We are a six-week training program. We provide four weeks actually in the classroom and two weeks hands-on in the field. While we do not teach any particular trade, we do actually ensure and support our candidates into moving into unionized apprenticeship opportunities. Over the last uh, 18 months, we placed 75 candidates within the building trades and to name a few, local 79 mason tenders, local 1010, Local 3 Electrical, DC 16 Cement and Concrete, and just to name a few. Our students are 60% NYCHA residents, 98% uh, people of color, and 28% female. We work with the Office of uh, Storm Recovery and Resiliency with, um, with NYCHA. And we solely support intro 674. We do feel that this is an opportunity for our students and to open up apprenticeship opportunities. We do train 124 students per year. And the reason why we keep that number is because we want to manage expectation. We do feel that we can increase that number, reaching out to more communities of color, reaching out to younger people who where college is not necessarily at that moment their career pathway, but also providing the opportunity to trades where they have an, op where they have an opportunity to learn, learn hands-on. And then with some of the trades, they're also able to earn credentials, um, an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. We do feel that um, local um, intro 674 would also support safety training. We start the process 
we start the process with teaching our students 30 hours OSHA, eight hour floor protection, two hour drug and alcohol, giving them um, you know, a measurement as to how they can judge safety on a particular site. We do teach our students that while construction is dangerous, you will, can, and will get hurt, but depending on the severity as to what will happen with you is, is uh, based on this level of safety training. So you're able to go out to that site, make a decision, make a decision to reach out to your shop steward related to your work at that particular site. We are hoping with the passing of intro uh, 674 that we can actually increase the capacity of moving candidates into apprenticeship opportunities where they have an opportunity to learn from the experts. They have an opportunity to go to school and acquire additional credentials. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Jason Ponce. Um, I am a pre-apprentice at Rebuilding Together um, NYC. I recently, I recently graduated hoping to secure a position as a union, um, unionized apprentice um, in the building trades. Um, specifically, I want to be in a DC-9. Um, we are in support of Intro 674. I will provide a pathway for people like myself to get in a career in the construction industry. We need, we need and want a good career as a unionized apprentice, and I want to be st to be stabilized um, for me and my family. That's, that's Thank you. Yeah. DC Nine is a great union. Hi, my name is Tanisha Cruz. Um, I'm a U.S. Naval vet. I also. Thank you for your service. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I we also support um, Intro Six Seven Four. It will allow for people like myself to get into the unionized building trades. I recently graduated f for a pre-apprentice program at Re Rebuilding Together. Thank you. Um, NYC, I look forward for the opportunity to work in a career that stabilized for my life and a life for my family. I look forward to the opportunity where I can work as an apprentice to learn from the best while working safe and contributing to the city of New York. Um, I also am um, looking forward to work with DC-9. And are you coming through the Helmets to Hard Hats program or a different no, program? We're building um, okay. together. We're building together. Great. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Kalos and all council members present. My name is Jamel Dickerson. I'm a proud member of Local 45 of New York City and vicinity, District Council of Carpenters. I'm a resident of Far Rockaway and a third year apprentice. Entering the carp Carpenter Apprentice Program has changed my life. I know that now I have a long-term career with upward mobility. I can support my family because I have stable work and benefits like healthcare. Many workers cannot say the same. I am grateful for the opportunity to be a union carpenter. Every day I learn something new on my training. The first classes you take as an apprentice involve safety. These classes include OSHA 10, four hour scaffold, construction floor protection, and hazardous materials, amongst others. When I stepped onto the job site for the first time, I knew I was equipped with the knowledge. I was prepared to carry out all tasks asked of me in the safest possible manner. I never felt unsafe or felt like my life was being put at risk. My training teaches me to be a safe worker while I gain real life experience. While being mentored by more experienced members on the job site, I have seen just how important safety training is. Construction is a dangerous job and there are many opportunities for someone to get hurt. If someone does not know how to perform the task properly, to put, uh, you can put everyone at risk. Intro 674 makes sure that all workers have the training that they need to work safely. When I graduate my apprenticeship, I know that I have the proper training to keep myself and others out of harm. I want other workers to have the same. Thank you for taking the time to consider my testimony. 
Thank you for your testimony. I, I just want to zero in on uh, an issue you brought up in terms of the apprenticeship and safety. Uh, can you talk to me about situations you've been in uh, previously or even on an open shop job where somebody didn't have the apprentice, same apprenticeship as you and didn't have the skills and where you felt like they were making dangerous decisions? Well, actually, I was fortunate enough. Um, I came into the company. I did a pre-apprenticeship program, mm -hmm. uh, so I never worked uh, at a, a non-union job. Oh, great. Uh, but other individuals that I worked with that were non-union before, they always tell me how lucky I am that we're s we that you know years ago they used to work very unsafe, and now it's lucky that I'm in a union where all I know is you know safety first. Uh, if anything, that say I have to go on a like the guy was talking about scaffold, I uh, make sure that I have a harness and make sure I'm tied up, tied off. And uh, guys tell me, you know, years ago they never had that opportunity. So I know just having conversations with guys that previously worked. Thank you. And for rebuilding together, you testified that you currently have 150 uh, apprenticeships per class. If we were to pass this law and open up more of the city contracts, uh, how large could you anticipate yourselves growing? So we actually keep um, the classes at 120 students per year. Okay. If you were to open up and pass this law, we could actually train more. We are a pre-apprenticeship program that's recognized by the um, New York State Department of Labor, and we're also a direct entry partner. So um, in that training, we actually start the process. We actually teach our students what it's like to work with on a construction site and how to work within unionized labor. So if you were to pass the law, we definitely would be able to provide more opportunities to those who reside in New York City. I, I want to thank this panel. I want to thank all of you for testifying. I want to uh, apologize for, to Jamel that we did not include you with the other panel with the rest of the car your brothers and sisters and the carpenters, but you got <laughs> to be on a panel with uh, some future brothers and sisters at DC9. So thank you very much and thank you to this panel for your great testimony. <laughs> Our uh, final panel today uh, is a panel in opposition from uh, uh, the NYCMWB Alliance 400 Foundation and G1 Quantum. Do we have Greg Waltman? Okay, uh, we are on our last panel. If you haven't had a chance, please make sure to fill out a slip. Uh, we're gonna just get that taken care of. Again, if you ha would like to testify but haven't had a chance, uh, you can submit your testimony within 72 hours to contracts at fencalos.com. Uh, just as uh, mentioned at the beginning of the hearing, this is the uh, testimony we already have in support. I wanna thank everyone for being under their uh, five minutes, and uh, you may begin. Thank you very much uh, to members of the council. Uh, my name is the Reverend Dr. Kali Mutu. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm a son of New York City, born and raised in the Bronx. Um, I am the pastor of Emmanuel Amy Church in Harlem. I'm the vice president for government relations for AL Consulting. We are an MWBE monitoring firm, um, and I'm one of the founding members of the 400 Foundation, uh, we are a moral movement for economic justice, working with uh, pastors, job training programs, uh, and small businesses across the state of New York. 
um, I don't really want to use the term opposed um, because we are not opposed to training and we are not opposed to apprenticeship programs. Great. Um, we are just opposed to the approach that the legislation takes to that. Um, this bill looks at apprenticeship programs from the top down and I think we should be looking at it from the bottom up and I'll tell you what I mean. Um, large firms um, and our large uh, trade unions have very robust training programs. Um, these programs are in place and they work very well. Um, doing a great job training our, our union shops, um, training our very large construction firms. Um, small businesses, small construction firms who are on their way up, um, when they reach the threshold, when they can, uh, uh, they can then uh, bid for jobs between that $1 million and $3 million threshold, um, they don't have the capacity to train their workers on that level. Um, they will then um, have to bid on jobs and increase their bid um, in order to cover the cost of training. Um, when larger firms bid on smaller numbers, um, what they're doing is increasing their bottom line. When smaller firms bid on these, on these same numbers, they are just keeping their firms alive. Um, right now, unions, um, they comprise about 20% of the construction jobs across the state of New York. That means that there's 80% of construction workers who work in non-union shops, and those shops normally bid on the lower jobs. So when we begin to put that added pressure on them um, and level the playing field so that it tips towards the larger firms, um, the smaller firms will suffer. Um, big firms do not need to have any help, um, and, it, and it seems as if this bill will help them um, rather than um, uh, helping our smaller firms. Um, if we want to truly impact training, um, we should pin a bill that does just that, that appropriates money for training, awards that money to independent training programs, many of which we saw testify here today, um, without impacting the procurement process. Um, when we say that numbers between one million and three million um, have to then uh, give a, a, have an apprenticeship program, um, we are now moving from the focus just being on training um, to impacting the procurement process, which then stops smaller firms um, from being able to win contracts. Um, passing this law the way it is written will force smaller firms to raise their bid, um, will price out MWBEs and lower their procurement. Um, initial training um, will not necessarily make the work site safer. Continued training will make the work site safer. We would, uh, we would propose um, that the bill would advocate for those who have been on the job for 10, 15, 20 years to receive continued training um, that is not necessarily connected with the threshold number. Uh, a, a firm that is bidding on a $100 million job still needs to have continued professional training to keep the work site safe, not necessarily the initial training, which doesn't always come from the local firm, but many times comes from independent firms who do a very good job of training, um, which is not connected to a procurement number. Um, we think that the bill um, should take the time to study how the $3 million threshold has impacted the apprenticeship process, has impacted training, um, and then come back and look and see how lowering it to $1 million would not only impact apprenticeship, um, but would also impact um, the MWBEs and the small businesses that normally bid at those levels. I thank you. Press, press the red button. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to address the uh, council in regards to this legislation. Um, I'm here today. I'm representing the New York City MWBE Alliance. I am also representing uh, Jock DeGraff at the 15A Coalition. I am a general contractor as well also a 2021 candidate for mayor. Um, as I sit here right now, I've heard a lot of people say a lot of things as it relates to safety. I'm a person that's all for safety. I'm for creating jobs. Um, I'm for higher wages. We live in the mo one of the most expensive cities there are in the world. But I think that this bill as written hasn't taken into consideration 
everyone that's involved and everyone that will be impacted by the implementation of this legislation. This legislation as it is currently will have a negative impact on MWBE firms. Right now the city has a goal for 30% utilization of MWBEs and the city already right now is not meeting that goal. Um, to put the additional burden of a apprenticeship uh, program on firms is not something that's going to help them, it's going to hurt them. I believe we need to come up with a solution that addresses the need for safety and I think that was partly done with uh, safety bill 1447 that requires now that regardless of contract size that all employees all employees of general contractors are required to have 120 hours of safety training that's regardless of whatever the size of the contract is so I believe that all of the issues related to the safety are addressed in that and that we should put on hold implementation of this until we look at all of the touch points and ensure that in imp implementing this, we're not hurting anyone else. We have to come out up with a solution that's going to work for everyone. Um, also, when we look at this bill, we need to ensure that I understand that firms, it seems fairly easy for a firm to become a union firm. But will that mean that that firm is now required to do union work going forward on all of their contracts? If, if that means that if a $500,000 contract comes through and that small firm now still has to work as a union firm, that will have impact. That will have impact on their ability to win projects, especially when they're now having to include that cost in their bid. And just like the other gentleman said, the larger firms already have that already in place. Um, I know there was an issue in regards to wage theft. The implementation of this bill is not going to address that. That's an issue that we have to address as it relates to being a decent person. Before we implement this bill, we have to address the requirements that look into how future projects that are under a million dollars will be implemented and impact. Before we uh, implement this bill, we need to address the issue of the city having slow payments. Because right now, the way the city pays, if you have a firm become a union firm and those dues are not paid, the city will actually be putting more businesses out of business. If we haven't addressed some of the other things that are going to have impact, we can't just look at this bill and say it's great to have more safety. There's going to be impact from other things. So before we do this, we have to address some of those issues. And I would just ask that um, there be some future constructive conversation on how we address this this legislation. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. It is an honor to be here again. I wanted to echo uh, the sentiments of my colleague, Reverend Mutu. My name is Reverend Reginald Lee Backus, Associate Pastor of the Abyssinian Baptist Church, also the president of the 400 Foundation uh, Incorporated. Uh, we are not here today in opposition of the bill. Uh, but just asking some questions. Uh, I started in Brooklyn, and there was a Brooklyn poet who said, men lie, women lie, but numbers don't. Uh, so what we're looking for is data that begins to show us the impact at the $3 million threshold, what will ha how will that translate at the $1 million threshold. And for us, it's across three areas, uh, primarily at the ground up level, as Reverend Dr. Mutu has said, workers and just participation, uh, just the disclosure of residency as well as gender and diversity makeup of how it impacted those at three million so that we can anticipate and go back to our communities and celebrate how this legislation will move that agenda forward if those numbers do exist. And then the second level, uh, greatly concerned about MWBEs, uh, uh, particularly MBEs. Uh, if you are a minority and a woman, you qualify as MBE, but we've seen uh, exclusion or evasion at times and lack of participation for minority owned businesses. So again, to see how it impacts the MBEs at the $1 million threshold with the baseline of the $3 million threshold to see uh, even in the report that I read, there's still some questions about how it will impact MBEs. We think that it's premature uh, to do that. Then finally, the, the, the third area, which we're very concerned about, affordable housing. 
Uh, we know we certainly do not have enough housing, particularly for the maturation of our congregations and the members in our congregation who are, who are tremendously concerned about where they will live as they've been historically faithful uh, to communities that are now turning over and with the new development want to ensure that they have a place in their home. So again, I want to reiterate we are not against it, but just asking for disclosure uh, of more information. The reason the 400 Foundation was found 1619 to 2019 from Jamestown, Virginia to 2019, 400 years. Uh, so we are a group that just advocates, raises questions, not necessarily against, but hoping that we can get the full disclosure of the information that we need so that we can go back and champion uh, progressive, truly progressive legislation that moves forward our agendas, again, making sure from the bottom up, men and women of color have opportunities to these great paying jobs. We're all for skills, we're all for training, we're all for safety, just want to ensure equitable participation, and then the MWBEs, we need that. We need to create home ownership, uh, create wealth ownership. 2053, black median household wealth will be zero dollars if we don't do something to increase ownership, and we think this has to be crafted in such a way to where it promotes business ownership so that 2053 does not become a reality, uh, particularly here in New York City. Then again, finally, affordable housing, how will impact there. We would just like the data in order to make a more informed decision. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, I'm big on data and evidence-based governance. Uh, I think you heard both I and another member of the committee ask for specific numbers on what the current impacts look like and uh, what they would look like. Uh, I want to just uh, start. I, I'm glad to have uh, somebody who, who does contracting. Do you currently contract with the city? Yes, I do. What size contracts do you typically bid on? Uh, we've done crop contracts up to a million dollars. So you're so you're still under the million dollars. Yes. So this legislation wouldn't affect you yet. Well, this legislation. Ho hoping you'll grow. Yes, that yeah. would be the goal, right? To be able to grow the firm until to to be able to get to that point. Okay. Uh, so, um, in have have you ever approached uh, uh, anyone about? anyone who offers apprenticeship programs to see how much it would cost you to, to offer that to your employees? Um, no, I haven't. Okay. Uh, I, th I think one of the items that came up today is whether it's a general contractor. Is so do you know, may, may I ask you what kind of work you tend to do? Uh, we specialize in t interior work, rough and finish carpentry. Okay. So. There, there may be an opportunity today to talk to some of the folks who are in the carpentry industry to see what changes would happen if, uh, whether or not you could take advantage of their uh, education fund and their training hall and, and what have you, and whether or not that could be a, a net benefit. Uh, in terms of the uh, your concern about being priced out, um, when a contract is under three million currently, how do different people who are bidding uh, set how much they're going to pay their employees? We have to uh, take the visual of the union versus the non-union shop, and we don't often like to do that because then it, it seems like there's a union, non-union fight, and um, I went to college off my, my uncle's union salary, so um, for me, unions are wonderful. Um, but when a, when a non-union shop has to price a job, um, there are certain types of jobs um, that they know they cannot bid on. And I will give you an example that, that fits into what we work with, um, affordable housing. Um, we priced an affordable housing unit. It was 40 units at $15 million. Um, and that was at the non-prevailing wage. If we did that job um, at the union wage, we would have had to just kill the project. Um, no bank would have funded it. It would have just cost too much, and we could not have did it affordable. Now, we could have done it market rate, um, but we were doing it in the South Bronx and Hunts Point, and that just would not have worked. Um, and so that's where the problem comes. That's where the problem lies. A large firm um, who already has a very robust training program, when they bid on an, a million-dollar job or a small job, um, that cost is already laid into their normal operating procedure and operating costs. Um, if my sister's firm here were to bid on a million dollar job, 
she then has to increase her bid. It would cost her more, um, and it's very likely she would not win that bid. Um, so those firms can uh, kind of absorb this. Um, it wouldn't cost them any more money because the training is inherent. Um, for the smaller firm, it is absolutely an additional cost. We have to find a way for the small firm to be able to train um, not have it be an additional cost to them, um, but still make sure that the training happens, that they have safe workers, and that they can uh, afford mm -hmm. to bid in the marketplace. Sure. Okay. And if I can just piggyback on what he was saying, so just so that we have clarity, there are different types of uh, pay rates for each project. There's something called living wage, prevailing wage, and then union. The difference, living wage is that you pay a, a living wage, and that's mostly private pro contracts. Prevailing wage are city contracts where the employee is paid a prevailing wage, but the wage and the benefits go to the employee. The union projects are union wages, which is similar in cost to prevailing wage, but the benefits go to the union. The issue is having to build into this, pro this uh, process, you will have additional expenses. Whether a firm is doing a job over a million dollars, it doesn't matter if I do a job over a million dollars tomorrow, right? And then the next day, the next month, I'm going back and I'm doing a job that's $750,000. But now, if I still have to pay into the union, that's going to affect me in a different way. Uh, can, can you please, so, so I think what you just said was very helpful. Tell me about the difference for paying the same amount versus through prevailing wage versus paying it to the union. What is the, what is the difference between paying somebody through basically the same amount as what you would acknowledge? What's the difference between paying it between the two? The difference would be is that if you're bidding the smaller job mm -hmm. and you have to pay it to through the union, the union rates are a little higher. Okay. So my ability to win that that other job will probably be, be less than someone else that's not going to pay that slightly higher rate wage. So let's say if I'm bidding the project and I bid $500,000, mm -hmm. but there's someone else that's paying prevailing wages and they're able to pay, they're able to bid 480, then that kind of puts me in a position that now I'm not going to win the larger jobs and I'm not gonna, lower jobs and I'm not gonna be able to be as diverse. To the extent you're talking about union jobs. Um, when there's a union job, you mentioned there's a prevailing wage, so on that, or whether it's prevailing wage or a union job, there's a, there's a set rate. Mm -hmm. And so does that prevailing wage apply to all the people bidding across the board? Yes. And uh, if, if there's multiple people bidding who have signed a union collective bargaining agreement, do they also have the same wage across the board? Yes, but most firms, especially the smaller firms that are growing, that are trying to build capacity, mm -hmm. um, they're not bidding on those larger jobs. And there is a cost associated with bidding. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're going to win one out of five contracts, you have put that cost into your mm -hmm. overall operation. If you now have uh, more difficulty um, in, in that barometer, you're now maybe only going to win one out of seven, one out of eight, because the union uh, and, and the big shop who would normally not bid on those low jobs, now do, um, it lowers your procurement rate, it raises your bid costs, and it becomes a, a, an added burden on the company. Uh, just to, and, and then in your testimony, you were raising concerns about affordable housing. I, I would like to see a prevailing wage and apprenticeship on affordable housing. I asked every single developer who's ever come before me to do so, particularly in the Planning Dispositions and Concessions Committee, that following asking that of every single developer was consequently dissolved. But that being said, I don't believe that this legislation uh, would go to affordable housing because this would be uh, projects administered by the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, which involves general construction and uh, maintenance projects. So you're talking more about like parks, roads, uh, projects like that. So I'm former CEO of Abyssinian Development Corporation, Mm -hmm. So for those of who have diverse organizations, Mayor's Office of Contract Services uh, does administer those type of contracts, but it affects the overall budget that affects community development corporations that are putting forth affordable housing. So there is a secondary cost, maybe not a direct cost, but there is an impact. I just want to clarify that point. Thank you. 
I, 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 I understand. The, the argument is that the, if a community development corporation is also dealing with these other projects that it will minimize their available funds for affordable housing? So there is one budget and that one budget impacts direct service programs as well as your affordable housing development. So if it affects A, it affects B, if it affects B, mm -hmm. it affects A. So I guess the, the other things I just wanted to share is one of the benefits of apprenticeship is often it's part of having a training hall. And generally when workers aren't on the job, they're able to go back to the training hall to get continuing education. So um, that's just something to, to share. In terms of getting priced out, I think one of the things, and I've been talking a lot in the human services contract, where they don't have prevailing wages because they they aren't as organized. And you often in situations where everyone gets pushed to the bottom and you end up with bizarre situations where uh, people who are doing literally the Lord's work and doing social work and trying to help congregants and what have you or that they're, they're making the, the minimum wage. And uh, that's just because folks are trying to compete and when you have a prevailing wage and uh, a, a rate that way, it at least sets a floor that people can't go below. Uh, so I think that's just, I, I wanted to get into a little bit of the concern about the big firm versus the small firm and the fact that I do want to work with folks and I've been talking to a lot of MWBEs about how do we make sure that more MWBEs can get into the big firm kind of contracts, but uh, in terms of unions being with big firms versus small firms. We heard testimony today from GCA and others that they, they have a broad gambit of employers that they work with. Um, so if, if you want to help me un understand that specific concern. Unions pay dues. Um, we uh, toured Local 70, was it? Local 79. Mm -hmm. 70, 79. Phenomenal, 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 phenomenal work they're doing. We saw their training facilities. Um, and we asked, how did you pay for this? He and said, I think a bunch of them are dues. here. Some of them were here. They said, union dues. We paid the dues, and we're mm -hmm. able to train. We went to one of the back classrooms, and I said, well, the guys in here look a little older. He said, those are our continuing education guys. They come back. Um, yeah. They get some refresher courses. Um, and I said, that's phenomenal. Um, for an open shop, they don't have that. Um, so yeah. it is, it is, it's just simple mathematics, simple arithmetic. That money goes in, there is training, but that training is, is ongoing, it's recurring. And so when you go into bid, um, that number does not come up as a hard cost for the company that's doing the bid. For a small firm, that number is a hard cost. My people are not paying dues. Their, their, their salary is going directly to them. So when I write it up, I have to write up that apprenticeship program, that cost for training as a hard cost in my bid. It raises my bid cost and so it puts me above wh uh, Why that not just, if, if, there's, if there's a group of people who are willing to take dues from the members so that it doesn't become a hard cost for you, why not just do that? Because union seats are finite. And so because 20% of the workforce is union, the other 80% is not. If there were enough union seats and union work for everybody to do it, hallelujah, I'd love for everybody to make $70 an hour. I'm for it. <laughs> I'm absolutely for it. But we realize that, that that's, that's finite. And so the question then becomes, what do we do to ensure those people who can't get into the union, um, that there's coverage for them, um, that there's safety for them, that there's training for them, but that there's also work for them? You're, you're talking to one of the lead sponsors of the construction safety bills. I, I think what we're trying to do right now, and I think you're talking about this 80-20 of, uh, and, and it differs by each industry. Some industries have a higher representation mm -hmm. than not, but by changing it from three million down to one million and adding these hundreds of millions of dollars in apprenticeship, the thought is that it would actually add more of those seats. And we heard from, um, we heard from new and we heard from rebuilding together and so many others that this would add the seats, it would add the throughput, and it would mean that there'd be more of these jobs for folks at the end of these good, high quality, $70 an hour jobs versus $15 an hour jobs. I, I would love for the opportunity for us to, to have that caucus 
um, to be able to really talk about the matrix of that, the metrics of it, how that would work, um, so that we could go back to our constituents and to our parishioners and say, we do have a solid plan that's going to cover everybody. We are 100% willing to come to that table um, and, and to make that happen. Mm -hmm. that, I really appreciate this. This is, I think, the most fruitful of any one of my hearings on this. Um, and uh, does anyone else, w has anyone else signed up to testify? Does anyone else wish to? Uh, I want to thank everyone for participating. I want to thank everyone who submitted testimony. I want to thank the, the panel for not necessarily actually being opposed, but just having concerns and working with us and just having an honest conversation. Uh, thank you to all of the members who are here. There's a lot of people here in orange shirts that seal, say real training equals real careers. And I want to thank them for spending the past uh, two and a half hours with us. And uh, I want to work with anyone I can to make sure that the city is safer for its workers. Thank you very much. This hearing is hereby adjourned.